Yep. Okay. So, uh, good evening or um, afternoon or hopefully not middle of the night um, to everybody. And welcome to the um, webinar um, presenting documents on digital sequence information on genetic resources. Um, it is the 3rd of November um, here in Montreal, and there will be a repeat of this webinar in 12 hours exactly from 8 to 9 a.m. on Friday, uh, tomorrow the 4th of November in Montreal. So just in case um, it is 1 or 2 a.m. for you, you can come back in 12 hours when you're rested uh, and see the exact same thing. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, DSI. This is item 5. Um, for the working group on the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. And the documents uh, we're going to talk about will be the basis of discussions in Montreal next month from the 3rd to the 5th of um, December. So in terms of housekeeping, uh, just know that this um, webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website for anybody who cannot make uh, this webinar or the next one. Um, the chat should, is open and uh, should be used for technical issues and if you need assistance and if you have any problems uh, on your side. Also, you're welcome to post questions on a process or any clarification um, on the documents or what we're presenting. This is, however, not a webinar on substantive matters. Right, this is not a negotiations webinar or something like this. So please refrain um, from having a sort of parallel conversation in the chat, uh, however tempting that might be to jump in and start discussing the SI. So put your questions on process and documents and the secretariat is monitoring them. Uh, there'll be a time at the end after all presentations to actually take those questions and answer them. Um, the page where documents are posted can be found at the bottom of the slide that you're seeing. Um, and the webinar will be in English only, and so will the slides. So today we'll see some opening remarks. We have several people giving opening remarks. Uh, then we'll have an overview of DSI within the process of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And then we have the co-lead, one of the co-leads of the informal co-chairs advisory group on DSI, which will present the outcomes of the work that has been done during this intersessional period. We will then look at the um, document um, CBDWG 2020 5-3, which is the main document on DSI for the working group. And we'll present, we'll talk about the associated documents as well, and then have a short closing remarks. And this is the program for the next hour or so. So without further ado, we'll have the first opening remark um, by the co-chair of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, Mr. Basil Van Have from Canada. Basil, the floor is yours. Merci Charlotte. Uh, good, uh, good time of the day to all of you. It's a pleasure to to be able to be with you, and it's a pleasure to see uh, this work coming to such an important uh, step in its process. Um, Francis and I have been uh, following very closely um, this process, and and we've been very pleased with the 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 work and the progress made under this informal advisory group. In fact, it's a model that we've been replicated for the GBF. Like you, you, you've all may have heard about the informal group that worked on the GBF. So we felt that uh, there was a little bit of trailblazing on the on the DSI side and lesson learned, and we've tried to apply those lessons on on other part of our work. I'm really looking forward to to see once again the the outcome, and and uh, I'm. In addition, looking forward to the work we will be doing in the uh, open-ended working group five in Montreal in a few days, and and subsequent to that at the COP. Today is an opportunity to uh, uh, make the cycle of the people engage directly in uh, in those discussion a little bit bigger. Um, that is that is something we're looking for. I think uh, for too, far too long, the SI has been kind of something under the purview of a, a small group of specialists. 
and what we did now, what we need now is to make this uh, something that all of us negotiators in the in the uh, in the GBF and in the in the 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 CBD cycle understand and familiar uh, familiar with. So I'm really uh, we we've insisted with Francis for those uh, those uh, webinar to take place, and we're looking forward to see your engagement, your questions, and we'll remain available to help and assist with uh, with whatever information we can. So. That's my introduction remark. Back to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, uh, Basile. <clears throat> and now we'll hear from uh, Mr. David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention. David, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And, and really, uh, I think I want to echo what, what Basile has said. Um, this has been a long road, a long and winding uh, winding road on on DSI since since COP14 uh, with uh, the ad work of the ad hoc technical expert group with the informal consultations that the co-chairs uh, of the of the post 2020 working group led um, and then more recently of course of the work of the informal advisory group and I think um, we are beginning to see light at the end of that road, the end of that tunnel, so to speak, and um, and that you know we can expect to come to a, I think a, a good conclusion uh, at the end of this year, and that's I think very much thanks to the work of the informal advisor group. I really want to express our appreciation to Gauti and Leticia and to all the members and participants in that group, uh, and as Basil said this is now an opportunity for uh, all the parties and uh, and all of those involved in the discussions henceforth to um, to make use really of the work of the informal advisory group. Um, I hope that the upcoming fifth meeting of the working group on the post 2020 framework just in those three days that we have before COP15 will be able to you know, make good use of the discussions of the, the results of um, of those discussions in the advisory group there, as we'll hear, um, I think from you later, um, Charlotte, they're summarized in the report of the of the working group and in the paper prepared by the by the secretariat. Um, I think we're looking for the working group to, you know, draw upon Yes, what has gone before in, in the working group in its recommendations at, at the third and fourth meeting, recommendations uh, uh, three, two and four, two, and now integrate and make use of this, this work from the informal advisory group to produce a coherent recommendation and draft decision for the COP. Um, so we're getting close to those last stages. Um, I think we have every reason to be uh, optimistic if we can get keep the keep going the very, very good cooperative spirits uh, and the, the really strong sense of cooperation we've seen among parties and also among all the different stakeholders that are represented in the advisor group. So I look forward to uh, the rest of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, David, for these uh, remarks. And now we will um, hear from Mr. Taokun Joshi Kong of the Secretariat, uh, who will give you a quick intro to the um, process of DSI within the Convention on Biological Diversity. Taokun? Uh, well, good evening, good morning to everybody out there. Uh, a quick intro of a very complex topic, and DSI is a well known topic by now in the circles of the CBD. Uh, and this topic was introduced back in 2016 as part of the agenda item on bar safety under emerging issues. And in 2018, it was discussed at the COP14, where decision 14 slash 20 committed the parties to work towards resolving the divergence of views regarding benefit sharing from the use of digital sequence information through a party-led process uh, these constitute what is now known as the formal process that is composed of a submission of views, 
a series of studies and an art tech uh, meeting. However, due to the extended intersectional period as a result of the pandemic, an informal process was also set up by the co-chairs of the working group on the post-2020 global arts framework to maintain momentum during that uh, uh, pandemic uh, time and to keep us uh, moving towards uh, finding some type of solution. Now, in the next slide, we can see the summary of the former process. Uh, four studies were commissioned on concept and scope, traceability uh, of DSI as well as databases. And these all ended up being put into one publication and uh, existing uh, domestic policy measures were also uh, uh, examined to see whether they can be used to address the issue of DSI. The ARTE considered these uh, studies. Additionally, the parties and other international uh, 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 organizations for concert, cons or concerned with DSI submitted their views with uh, which were then synthesized for the ARTEC to also take into consideration. The meeting of the ARTEC considered all this information and developed uh, what can be considered as options for operational terms, such as potential groupings for the scope of DSI, as well as uh, identified key areas for capacity building with regard to DSI amongst others. The studies, views and reports of the meeting can all be found on the CBD uh, website. The informal process that took place consisted of a series of webinars, uh, which are all also available on our website. Uh, the first two set um, gave a baseline of understanding of what uh, uh, DSI can be considered to be and also how it is produced, distributed, and used, in essence, the science of DSI, what it is, as well as, uh, 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 as it's attempted to summarize the outcome of the formal work of the ARTEC uh, report. The third webinar then took all publications and proposed uh, policy solutions on DSI and just synthesized them into uh, what can be considered as policy archetypes, for which we now refer to as the policy options, and Charlotte will uh, take you through these uh, just now. Um, and then the last webinar in this series looked at um, if these policy options have to be considered, what criteria could be used to, to, to assess them uh, in terms of uh, would they be able to do what they are intended to do um, in the end. Finally, an online forum allowed all parties and stakeholders to discuss the policy options and criteria for a few weeks. And the summary of this forum can be found in the documents in preparation of the second part of the third meeting of the working group on the post-2020 global buzz framework. Uh, my colleague Charlotte will now present the policy options and criteria as they have come out of the work of the IEC. Over to Charlotte. Thank you very much, um, Tauko. So looking at this slide, um, you can see that the policy, what the policy options are right now. Uh, they have been updated uh, since the time of the third webinar in the series that Tauko just talked about. So please make sure that when you uh, want to find them, you refer to the latest documents uh, to actually find the, the updated um, table. Also remember that the policy options are archetypes and modalities and details have not yet uh, been developed for most of them. So very quickly, I'll just go through them one by one. So option zero is a status quo, uh, means that nothing changes um, to compare to what is already happening now. Um, so there is um, uh, the, the divergences remain and, and basically nothing is sorted. Option one is a scenario where DSI is fully integrated into the domestic ABS measures and we have um, and the, the um, a negative protocol and so we have a pick and a match 
that uh, could be required for the access potentially to each of the sequences. Option two is a bilateral system with a standard uh, mutually agreed terms or MAT. Um, within this option, we have 2.1, um, which proposes that each party establishes its own system and the user would have to deal with each party separately when wanting to access um, you know, a set of DSI of sequences, basically. Option 2.2. Uh, proposes an international system where the user would declare the use of DSI and then the system would then deal with the allocation of benefits according to the country of origin and would be in charge of um, those standard maths with each of the uh, country of origins, um, assuming that information is available. Option three, um, prones a multilateral mechanism. Uh, and it's um, split, so option 3.1 proposes that this multilateral mechanism be um, financed um, through a payment uh, to access the data itself. Um, and option 3.2 proposes other types of payments. Uh, we will see a little bit later that this option 3.2 uh, had to be further split and separated into sub-options. Uh, depending on where the payment or contribution um, is taken along the, the value chain. So it, it encompasses several proposals uh, in this 3.2. Option four um, proposes a system to enhance technical and scientific capacity and cooperation and uh, technology transfer. Option five is a scenario where the parties agree that they should be no benefit um, sharing uh, that would come from the use of DSI. And finally, option six um, comes from the African proposal and uh, basically is a proposal for a 1% levy on the retail sales of um, products coming from genetic resources um, along, you know, with the creation of a multilateral mechanism. So these are our six options. Um, each of those options in this table is related to some criteria uh, on the right and on the left, you can see with the arrows, and it basically helps us sort of understand the main characteristics, um, such as regulation of access, you know, presence of pick and match, um, and or mat, I should say, uh, bilateral or multilateral mechanism, the need to trace the country of origin, of the genetic resource from which the DSI was extracted, um, etc. So these are um, some of the sort of fundamental criteria that um, we can think of the options through. Um, these options are assessed separately, but obviously they can be combined into a solution, such as, for example, a hybrid solution that would use a multilateral mechanism with some bilateral components or a sort of compound solution that would combine, you know, two, three, maybe four, several of those options or sub options. Um, the next slide here looks at the um, assessment criteria, which uh, the informal advisory group on DSI agreed upon. So this is the uh, product of a lot of work uh, from this group. Um, and the working group actually took note of um, this set of criteria, as well as the policy option table. Um, so in this matrix, um, matrix um, you will hear a bit more about it in a few minutes, but very briefly, there are 19 criteria classified in four categories. Um, so the effectiveness of achieving policy goals uh, mostly relate to the goals of the policy. And the three other categories of efficiency and feasibility, enabling of good governance and coherence and adaptability relate can be seen as relating more to the sort of characteristics of um, the policies um, solution. We should note here that not all criteria are equal and um, there's been no weight that has been assessed by the um, informal advisory group or any other group yet, um, but some criteria can be seen as a founding principle by some parties. Um, and others are more practical and nice to have criteria that we should aim for, um, but might not be as fundamental. So they're not all equal, but they all should be, you know, considered 
um, in the assessment of the policy options. In this slide here, we can see that um, DSI has been considered by the working group on the post-2020 GBF uh, at its third and its fourth meeting. And at each of those meetings, a recommendation came out. So uh, recommendation three slash two takes note of the formal and informal process to date. Um, also presents some draft elements of a recommendation, uh, particularly in paragraphs five and six, and a list of topics for the IAC to continue its work. Um, as well as a draft recommendation that contains several brackets. Uh, recommendation four slash two uh, recalls recommendation three slash two, so it doesn't um, replace it. Uh, it requests the IA to continue its work. Uh, it drafts several elements of a decision, and some still have brackets, but some actually uh, the, uh, the group managed to lift uh, the brackets um, from. And also, it contains an appendix with two proposed solutions. One is quite well developed, and the second is not yet developed, but mentioned um, in this appendix. Both these recommendations are important, and I invite you to consult them and read them. Um, and four slash two will be the basis of the discussion at the fifth meeting of the working group, along um, with the work of the IAG uh, at this last intersessional period. So now um, I would like to give the floor to one of the co-leads of this informal co-chairs advisory group on DSI, uh, who will tell you a little bit about the work of this group during this intersessional period uh, since the meeting uh, in Nairobi. So Mr. Gauter van Hansen of Norway, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Secretariat. Um, so it's my pleasure to present the content of the document, uh, CBD uh, Working Group 2020 um, slash five slash in slash one, which reports on the work of the informal co-chairs advisory group on DSI in this intersessional uh, period. In terms of the organizational matters, the last meeting of the contact group on DSI at the fourth meeting of the working group came up with a list of topics that the IAG should consider before its fifth meeting. While the legal feasibility and scope of DSI were seen as cross-cutting, the fair and care principles of data governance were summarized in a paper that is annexed to the IAG report. All of the topics were the subject of their own discussions, as can be seen on this table. This was the third intersessional period for this IAG to meet. And so the organization was quite smooth and the positive spirit continued prevailing as it had before. The first and second meetings were dedicated to inviting other ABS mechanisms and discuss the potential for mutual supportiveness. Uh, and in the second meeting, hearing summaries of informal discussions and studies on DSI. The group was faced with a list of topics to tackle but also with a setback. The consultant that was initially hired to conduct an independent economic assessment of the policy options using the matrix or criteria that the Secretariat just presented could not complete the work. The situation was out of anyone's control and unforeseen, but the IAG came together to find a solution to this issue. It was agreed with the co-chairs that the members of the IAG may they be parties, non-parties, IPLC representatives or stakeholder representatives would go through this exercise themselves and fill in the matrix according to their own point of view and assessment of which policy option they would favor. As such, the Secretariat organized an online discussion forum where all participants could ask questions, post remarks, discuss with each other and finally upload their matrices for all members of the IG to see and consider. The group then came together to discuss the potential convergences and apparent divergences in the assessment of the policy options on DSI. Finally, the last meeting was dedicated to hearing proposals and comments on policy solutions, namely option six, proposing a multilateral mechanism funded by a 1% levy on retail sales of products from genetic resources, 
followed by two presentations on a hybrid solution where the various modalities were discussed with the group. The IG did a lot of work in the past few weeks, and we hope that this will help the discussion on DSI, DSI at the next meeting of the working group and subsequently at the COP. So here you can see the compilation of the assessments that came from the IEG. Uh, 25 matrices were submitted, representing 38 participants of the advisory group. In the top row, you can see the proposed policy options with option 3-2 split in three parts. Little a represents the payment or levy on products or services as input to scientific research. Little b, represents the creation of labels linked to voluntary contributions to a fund for DSI. And finally, little c represents a levy on products that results from the use of DSI. In the left column, we have our 19 criteria, uh, which the Secretariat presented a few minutes ago. In this table, the red represents a policy option that does not satisfy the, uh, the criterion, the green scores a policy option uh, as satisfactory for the criterion, and the yellow means that more details are needed. Often on the modalities of the policy options which have yet to be uh, developed, because of course these are archetypes. The gray represents no answer. Each of the squares at the cross of a policy option and the criterion was split into 25 smaller squares representing the scores from the 25 matrices. As we look at this table, we can see that rows one and two, representing the potential for predictable monetary and non-monetary benefits, show more red on the left, with options or no solution, pick and mat or a bilateral solution, while on the right there is a lot more green with the multilateral mechanism or capacity building options. Rows three and four show even stronger patterns of red on the left and green on the right, and these criteria represent open data and no hindrance of research and innovation. These are criteria that have been discussed as fundamental by the IAG. Next, rows five and 17 represent the potential contribution to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and the sharing of benefits with IPLCs. We can see red on the left once more, some green on the right, and quite a lot of yellow in the middle. This last pattern can be found for other criteria too, with options 0, option 1, and 2.1 yielding, yielding red scoring, and the option on capacity building and enhanced scientific collaboration yielding a majority of green scoring. The options proposing a multilateral mechanism are quite positive, but a lot of yellow shows that modalities need to be developed further. You can see this matrix and its detailed explanation in our report. So here, we wanted to show you the answer to a question that we ask alongside the matrix. Should this option be considered for further analysis for a solution on DSI? We thought the answers were significant for the working group discussions. The pattern here confirmed the previous table, the option on capacity building, technical and scientific collaboration and tech transfer is to be considered further for 100% of the people who answered but as part of a solution rather than a solution on its own. The options proposing a multilateral mechanism of benefit sharing should all be considered further, but for the one proposing a payment for access to the data. However, all these multilateral options require further information, particularly development of modalities. Finally, all the solutions that do not promote benefit sharing or propose a bilateral solution yielded a majority of answers not to consider them further. Only the bilateral solution with a global standardized MAT, mutually agreed terms, could be considered as part of a hybrid solution. 
We believe, believe that these trends could also be considered by the working group in Montreal. So this last slide from me is a short recap of the work that the informal coaches advisory group has done on DSI since the first part of the third meeting of the working group over a year ago, which was the first time since COP14 uh, that DSI was taken up uh, formally. We can see that the group was representative with regional gender and sectoral inclusion. The stakeholders were included for two out of the three intersessional periods. We had 13 working group meetings, so three hours or more, tackling 23 topics and bringing experts within and outside the advisory group to give a total of 34 presentations. We built an analytical framework as part of an approach we agreed upon, discussed convergences, convergences and divergences, and finally did our own assessment of the proposed policy options. We would like to thank all who have participated and facilitated and hope that this work will allow a solid recommendation to be presented by the working group to the conference or the parties in December. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Colit, for taking us through this uh, complex matrix and for putting the work of the IAG into perspective like this, um, more than a, a year's worth of work. Um, now, to finish, let me present the main document on DSI for the fifth meeting of the working group. And so this document is uh, CBD slash WG 2020 slash five slash three. Um, so this document contains three sections. The first one is a background where uh, we recall uh, past decision, the mandate of the working group uh, on the post 2020 global diversity framework. Uh, which is to present the conference of the parties with a recommendation on how to address DSI in the context of the post-2020 GBF. Uh, the document recalls the work of the IAG and also the recommendation um, 3-2 and 4-2, which we covered earlier. The second part of the document uh, goes over key points from the co-leads report on the work of the informal co-chairs advisory group. Uh, and presents a summary of the matrix assessment we just heard from uh, Gauter. It also identifies the two main gaps, um, namely the uh, modalities for the distribution of the funds from a potential multilateral mechanism, and the need to include the economic impact of the proposed policy as a criterion in any future work. Uh, finally, the last section uh, of the document covers elements uh, to consider uh, in a way forward regarding DSI. Uh, this section proposes that the working group in the search of a solution on DSI uh, may wish to consider some emerging elements such as a multilateral mechanism or the inclusion of the enhanced technical and scientific cooperation and capacity building option, um, a hybrid element to the approach, and uh, the need for a solution that is simple and rapid, rapid to um, implement. The working group could also consider modalities that would take into account the support for the conservation and use of biodiversity, as well as activities led by IPLCs. Finally, any prejudice to existing rights and responsibilities under the convention and the Nagoya Protocol should be addressed. In the annex of this document, uh, you can find the results of the assessment of the proposed um, policy option, um, a compilation of the scores from the informal advisory group, which we just saw, and also the compilation of answers to the question, uh, should this option be considered for further analysis for a solution on DSI, which was also presented um, to you. Uh, the last slide for me uh, is basically uh, the main documents um, on DSI, which we encourage you to um, go and consult before the working group in Montreal. So the two documents in blue on DSI, which we just covered, uh, in orange, the two recommendations, which we have mentioned um, a few times from the previous working groups, uh, which will be the basis of discussion in Montreal. And uh, in gray further down, some references to previous reports 
of the IAG and the ATEC report uh, for you to consult. So with this, I want to thank you and we have some time to actually take questions. Uh, so, Secretariat, we have been uh, monitoring the chat. Do we have any questions? Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so I am looking at the chat. Uh, this is your opportunity, you know, to ask any clarifying questions on the documents or any content that was presented to you today. Um, there were a number of comments by Joseph Vogel, not all formulated as questions, so it, it's a bit difficult, but I think there was um, the wanting to know a bit more information about the assessment that was to be carried out and uh, why it didn't happen as foreseen. Sure, so as we said, uh, these were unforeseen and con you know conditions out of our control. Uh, we are not at the, uh, it is not our right to divulge <laughs> uh, personal, consider, you know, personal circumstances that would uh, force a consultant to actually um, not finish the work for which uh, he or she was hired. Um, but it is just um, the way it is, and the AI came together uh, with the co-chairs uh, to actually face the, the situation. It also has to be reminded that there was very little time uh, between working groups, and so we just had to move very fast. Uh, procurement is a long and painful process, as we all know. Uh, and so uh, this was actually a really good, what we consider a, a really good outcome of the work of the IAG on this um, assessment and the gap on the actual economic uh, assessment was noted in the in the report of the IAG and in the paper on DSI. So I hope that answers your question. We have a number, a very long comment here more detailed questions about the assessment that perhaps we can reach out later by email. Um, and OK, there's a question coming in here from David Ellis. Did the committee consider how non-monetary benefits could be considered? I believe that was a criteria two. Maybe you can add a bit more information, Charlotte. Yeah, so non-monetary benefits uh were considered not in a great depth, um, I have to say, uh, and it was also one of the, the recommendations, uh, I believe from the last, so not this report, but the last report of the IAC to actually consider it further. Um, and there's not a ton of literature that has been, uh, that is available on that topic as opposed to, uh, you know, benefits more generally. Uh, but obviously, option four on enhanced scientific cooperation, tech transfer, and capacity building is a huge part of what non-monetary benefits would be and how they would be considered. And I really uh, uh, invite people to read that, pa the, you know, the call of the papers who go in depth into this, they're very interesting. But the IAG itself uh, did not have extensive uh, conversations on that. Hopefully that answers your question, David. And here I have, a, I think, a partial question from Manolo. Um, just a comment that not all available policy options were included. Perhaps, Gauté, if you want to address that. Yeah, thank you for, for that question. Uh, we have to remember that the, the policy option uh, on the table that we have are archetypes, right? So so then they're not really, they're sort of more theoretical um, policy options than actual practical ones. So uh, we have discussed uh, hybrid options that were pre presented by, by some parties. Um, so I think the answer is that there are more uh, <laughs> policy options, but I think they they are um, probably uh, we'll see them 
clearer when when modalities are developed um, that parties can can sort of assess and then and then finally in the end come to uh, uh, a conclusion and a solution. So there has been a number of comments on uh, bounded openness, and I'll just not pretend that I'm any expert on bounded openness at all, but I would like to address uh, those comments. And uh, one is that bounded openness, like way back when we were doing the, the series of webinar on DSI, so with the third webinar on policy options, I remember going through the literature and, and trying to, um, you know, sort of whole options together into these archetypes in a way that would uh, hopefully help uh, parties and stakeholders make sense of them because that literature was very dense. Um, it was a while ago, uh, so uh, maybe some newer literature has not all been um, taken into consideration. I uh, will um, say that gladly. Uh, also, bounded openness was uh, part of um, option 3.2, and I recall actually answering some questions on that uh, during the, the question and answers at the end of the third webinar. Um, and the second part to my answer is that bounded openness has been mentioned and discussed as part of the option six, uh, the African proposal actually uh, I believe has included, uh, you know, some of the concepts of uh, bounded openness um, um, for, you know, in their own way and in, in their own proposal, uh, but it's um, it's not a, a concept that's been ignored. I'll just say that um, uh, along the way of, of the work on DSI. Um, Maybe if I also just uh, add to that, uh, Charlotte, you write that the African proposal did, when they presented it, they did mention that it has got an element of, of bounded uh, openness. Along uh, the, the sort of thought lines of uh, Mr. Fogel, and the, what we must keep in mind is that the mandate of the, of the, of the IAC was not to come up with a solution because they are too money to negotiate, but rather to consider all options that were on the table and to flesh them out to then sort of point to a direction that the parties may be able to take, and they have done so. And uh, despite the fact that the issue of, of economics uh, may not have been discussed, it was brought up and as recommended, it is recommended now in the document that uh, parties, as they consider these policy options, they must keep in mind that the issue of economics is important and must be contained as a criteria as they go uh, forward. And also, uh, uh, it was reflected that all options uh, are still at the table as they go to the working group for further negotiations. And then at that, at that point is where parties can decide what remains in, what uh, 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 can be taken out. Thank you. Are there any other questions on process or documents? There's a question on the composition of the IAG, which I can refer to the report, uh, which has the list of participants in Annex, so I can provide that as a link, but I do not see any more specific questions uh, on the process that was presented today. So uh, back to you, Charlotte. Yes, um, thank you. Um, greatly. So, yeah, so that was the questions. And um, now I would like to invite um, Taupo back 
um, to take the floor and give um, some closing remarks. Falco, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. Um, reflecting on what has been presented uh, here tonight, uh, this morning, or this day, it is clearly evident that much ground has been covered uh, regarding DSI from 2016 till now. And as was said by the co-chair, uh, Vasil, a lot of uh, work has been done. And at this point, the end is near, but it's not yet clear. And more critical work remains uh, to bring all these to a positive conclusion. And it calls for uh, decisive uh, 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 um, in-depth look at what is now in front of us. The process has so far been characterized by a constructive spirit of cooperation, willingness to listen to the underlying interests and rationales that underpinned the various positions advanced by those around the table. It was further characterized by the willingness of those at the table to allow other stakeholders to come to the table, provide their interest and concerns in a constructive, positive and enabling environment and spirit. It was indeed that spirit of constructive transformative change that brought this work to where it is today. Therefore, on the eve of going to the working group, may this spirit continue to be with us all as we move towards this open, the next Open Network Working Group 5 and the COP in Montreal later next month. At this point and this juncture, may we thank you all for making time in this decisive moment to have come to partake in this offering where we shared with you the documents, uh, the rationale behind the documents and the work that has gone out to try and elucidate this issue of DSI. Those that are about to go to bed, sleep well. Those who are waking up, have a peaceful day. Those that are already in the day, have a beautiful day. Peace to all and thank you all that has made it to this webinar today. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Tauko. This webinar is now over. Wish you a very good day, night, or whichever time of the day. Uh, the secretary is available for any questions or comments you may have, so feel free to reach us. Um, and the webinar and the slides will post it on our, on our website in a few days. Um, so thanking you very much again. Um, have a good uh, rest of your day. Bye.